The portion of God's word on which we'll focus our hearts this morning comes from Colossians chapter 3. Let's begin with prayer. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It was just one week ago that we heard the chorus of angels praising God before the shepherds. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. One week since we joyously sang those same praises. Hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Just one week ago at Christmas, we marveled at the promise, the truth of God, that because Jesus was born, there is peace on earth. So have you been feeling that peace this past week? I don't know about you, but I still heard news reports about, about murders and drive-by shootings and wars that are being fought across the globe. I'm guessing your deployed loved ones didn't get to come home because now there are no longer any threats that needed to be defended against. I'm guessing that with family gatherings and kids home from school over Christmas break, maybe you've even felt the lack of peace in your own family over the last week. So where exactly is this peace on earth that the angels were singing about a week ago? Well, in one sense, we shouldn't think of it that the angels were telling us to expect literal peace on earth because Jesus was born. But in another sense, there really is peace on earth because Jesus was born. And that might sound contradictory to our ears, but let's look at God's word to explain how that works. First, let's look at our gospel for today, where we meet uh, an old man by the name of Simeon. We're told about Simeon. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And trusting in this promise from God, Simeon had been waiting and watching for his faith to become sight. Until one day, he was moved by the Holy Spirit to go to the temple courts in Jerusalem, and there he saw something that seemed rather ordinary. A young family, a husband and wife with a a month-old baby boy, there in the temple to make the necessary purification and consecration sacrifices that every Jewish family that had a new baby boy would have to make. In fact, Mary and Joseph and Jesus were probably not the only ones in the temple that day there to do that exact same thing. And yet, through eyes of faith, Simeon was able to see something absolutely extraordinary in that very ordinary family. Taking the month-old baby Jesus in his arms, he proclaims, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. There's that word again, right? Simeon said that he could now depart, be dismissed in peace. And notice why. My eyes have seen your salvation. By faith, Simeon could see in that baby boy not just a child who would grow up to be an earthly king and maybe see some earthly wars and conflicts, Not just an earthly king who could put some salve on the troubles and trials and struggles that rob so many people of peace in their lives. In fact, to Mary and Joseph, Simeon described that this child, Jesus, would actually cause a lot of conflict and grief, even to Mary. As he told her, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. Jesus didn't come to bring literal peace in the way we think of it, peace to this earth. In fact, because this world is broken by sin and because it's occupied entirely by sinners who have a selfish, sinful nature that leads us to selfish actions and attitudes, this world in which we live will never be a world full of peace. 
And that's the reason that wars and murders and conflicts and combat is a regular occurrence in our lives today. This is part of it. And the reality is because we are also sinners who have that selfish, sinful nature inside of us, we and our attitudes and actions are often the cause of the lack of peace in our own lives. But Simeon was saying that he could depart in peace, not because Jesus came to bring literal peace to this earth, but because through those eyes of faith, Simeon saw that this child, this baby, was the Son of God. He saw in this child salvation, the Savior of the world, the one that God had promised to send, who through his perfect life, and his suffering and death and resurrection from the grave would restore peace between a holy God and sinful mankind. So yes, as the angel sang, there is peace on earth because Jesus was born. Peace between God and sinful mankind. And so like Simeon, we also can look forward to the day when we will depart in peace because of that peace that we have with God. But that peace with God that we have through Jesus also means that we can live in peace in this life. And that's where Paul's read, our second reading from Paul's letter to the Christians in Colossae comes into the picture. Paul writes, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You notice what Paul does first? Before he goes on to encourage these Christians to clothe themselves with the kind of attitudes and actions that promote peace in this life, first he reminds them of the peace that they have with God. He says, you are God's chosen people. You are holy. You are dearly loved. Before telling them what they ought to do, Paul first reminds them why they ought to do it. He points them to the peace that they have with God before telling them to then live in peace. Because it's that peace that we have with God through Jesus that motivates us to live in peace in this life as well. In other words, you could say it's peace in, peace out. The more that we are renewed and reminded of the peace that we have with God through Jesus, the more that peace is going to flow out of us into our lives. So Paul says that these peace-promoting attitudes that we want to display, as Christians, those are attitudes that are going to be so prevalent, so identifiable in our lives, that it's like that's what we're wearing as our clothing. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Aren't those the kind of attitudes that are necessary for us to be able to live in peace with ourselves and each other in this world? And aren't these the kind of actions that are necessary for us to live at peace with others in this world? To bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. But again, notice first of all that Paul reminds them why they should do that. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Peace in, peace out. So how's that been going for you? Are those the kind of attitudes and actions that people would describe you with and the way that you live your life? Are those the kind of attitudes and actions that you would use yourself to describe your life and the way that you live? If I'm being perfectly honest, I don't think I can say that about myself always. And I'm guessing you can't either. Because of that sinful, selfish, sinful nature inside of us that pulls so strongly at our hearts and our minds, it is incredibly difficult for us to live at peace with each other in this life. Even more so if we fail to take to heart the encouragement that Paul gives us here to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace. Let the peace of Christ, that is, the peace that we have with God through Christ, let that peace rule in your heart. 
What does that mean? We might picture peace ruling on our hearts like a tyrant king sitting on a throne, just telling us, regardless of the circumstances, well, just be at peace. That's a hard thing for us to fathom, right? In a world where so many things are going on and so many things are happening in our lives that make it seem like it's impossible for us to truly be at peace. But the Greek word here that's translated as to rule paints a different picture. It's a different picture than a a tyrant king sitting on a throne making impossible demands of his people. Instead, that word, raboyato, it means to to control or to order or to rule. But in the sense of what an umpire does in a game. You see, an umpire in a game, their job is to control and order that game, but not just by making judgment calls based on their own personal preferences and opinions. Now, the umpire controls that game by making correct judgments based on a set of standards and rules that are already in place. And that's the same way that the peace of Christ rules and orders and controls our own hearts. That peace that we have with God through Jesus, everything that happens in our life, it has to filter through that kind of peace so that we can make judgments, correct judgments, based on that standard of peace that we already have with God. Whether this thing that's happening in our life is something that can rob us of our peace or something that can prevent us from being at peace with other people. If the peace that we have with God through Jesus is what is ruling and controlling and guiding and directing our lives, then how much better are we going to be equipped to live at peace with each other? Peace in, peace out. Like I said before, isn't it selfishness? Isn't it the selfishness of our sinful nature that so often roadblocks peace in this world and in our own lives? Isn't it that sinful, selfish desire for power or wealth or revenge that drives so much of the war and conflict that takes place in this world? Isn't it a selfish desire to always be right and to have our way and to impose our will on other people? that robs us of peace in our personal relationships? Isn't it the selfish desire to hang on to the sins that other people have committed against me so I can benefit from them that makes it impossible for me to forgive that person who has robbed me of peace? But if the peace that we have with God through Jesus is what rules and directs and controls your life, then you're so much better able to live at peace. Because that reality, that standard of truth of the peace that we have with God through Jesus, it subdues our selfishness. Peace in, peace out. And that peace that we have with God, if we cling to it, it changes the way that we deal with those circumstances in our lives. Let me give you some examples of how this works. I am at peace with God which means that when the sins that I've committed fill my heart with shame and guilt, when they try to rob me of peace, they can't because those sins have been forgiven because I'm at peace with God. I'm at peace with God, which means that I can freely and willingly forgive other people who have sinned against me because that's the way that God has forgiven me to make me at peace with him. I'm at peace with God. And that means that it doesn't have to destroy me and rob me of peace if I don't have the love and approval of every single person in my life. Because I already have the love and approval of the only one that really matters. I am at peace with God. Which means that we don't have to be robbed of peace and filled with anxiety and fear as we try and carve out some sort of an identity and purpose and meaning and value for our lives by the things we do and the things we've accomplished. Because I already have perfect identity and meaning and purpose and value for my life because who I am in him who has made me at peace with him. I'm at peace with God. Which means that even when I deal with struggle and suffering and hardship in my life, it doesn't have to rob me of peace. Because if God was willing to give up everything so that I could be at peace with him, 
can I trust that he's also going to use those things for my good and my eternal peace? Like Simeon, because I'm at peace with God, that means I can even be at peace in the face of death. Because I know that when that time comes, I'm going to peace out and be with Jesus. Over and over again, that reality that we are at peace with God, it curbs the way that we handle all of those other circumstances in our lives so that we can be at peace. If we take that to heart, then we'll be so much better equipped and empowered to live at peace with ourselves and to live at peace with each other. And that's why Paul encourages us to keep putting peace in to continue being renewed and reminded of the peace that we have with God through Jesus. As Paul writes, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. See, Paul mentions three ways in there that we can put peace in. The first is by letting the message of Christ, the gospel, the good news that we have peace with God through Jesus, letting that message from God's word dwell richly among us. Paul is saying that we want being in the word to read it and hear it and study it and learn it to be such a prevalent, intentional part of our life that it's like God's word has taken up residence among us. And every time that we hear and read and learn and study God's word and the spirit works through that, that's peace going in. And we have that every time that we hear and read God's word in personal or family devotion time, in Bible studies or Sunday school, as we gather to hear the word of God in worship. The Holy Spirit is working through that to bring peace in. The second way is through what we're doing right now. As we gather to worship, to build each other up in encouragement, as we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs that are pulled from the very word of God. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs that remind us of the truth that we have peace with God. So when we gather together as a congregation and we worship, we're bringing peace in. And thirdly, notice what Paul says. He says to teach and admonish one another. We put peace in when we surround ourselves with a Christian community. See, God has never intended for us to be spiritual islands, to be isolated and separated from other Christians. It's God's intention that we would surround ourselves with other Christians who it can encourage us and fill us with love and peace with God, with those who share the same faith as we have. It's God's intention to give us opportunities within a Christian community to show love to other people, to be at peace in the way that we live and interact with each other within that Christian community. But unfortunately, sometimes, that Christian community that God intends to be something that brings peace in can be a place that feels devoid of peace. Because churches are comprised of sinful people, means that sometimes Christian family is going to hurt or harm or offend each other. It means that we have a sinful nature that's still selfish and wants my way to be the way, that wants to get my way to be always right, to impose my will on other people, and if I'm not going to get it, then I'm going to cause problems within that Christian community. The fact is, selfishness within a Christian family can cause rifts and divides and divisions within a congregation that can rip it to shreds. Maybe even make it a peace that is devoid, a place that is devoid of peace. Which is exactly why it's so important that we continue coming back to that Christian community. Because as we gather as a Christian community, we are taking in the very things that Paul is talking about that can empower us to better live at peace with each other as we gather to hear and study the Word of God, as we gather to worship, we are given an opportunity to be empowered and equipped to better live at peace with each other, 
to forgive one another as Christ has forgiven us, to not be so insistent on being right because we know that we're already right with him. Christian community and family is a beautiful opportunity for us in the love that God has shown to us to then show love and peace in the way we interact with each other. And as we do that, as we come back again to that Christian community as as flawed and filled with sinners as it might be, to come back again and again to be reminded and renewed in the peace that is ours so that we can better clothe ourselves with things like kindness and compassion and love so we can better do the things that promote peace, like to bear with each other despite our differences, to forgive each other when we have complaints or grievances against each other. The more that we gather together to bring peace in, the better that peace will come out. So although in this life we're never going to experience perfect peace, and although we'll never be at perfect peace with each other, because Jesus came and because we have peace with God through him, that means that you and I can be better equipped to live at peace with each other. In peace and love and forgiveness. And as we do so, we look forward to the day when like Simeon, we also will be able to depart in peace. Looking forward to the day when Jesus will come again and finally and fully establish true and lasting eternal peace in the new heavens and the new earth that he will make. And so today, just like a week ago on Christmas and every day into the new year that we're going into, we're able to sing with joy the words of the angels, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled at peace. 